So uh, we've been looking at Matthew chapter 18, and uh, just to give you a real quick summary um, of what we've looked at last week and the, and the couple weeks before that is the idea of we're addressing ongoing sin in a mature Christian. Okay, so two things with that. Ongoing sin, not, not something that they're doing that you don't like, an actual sin and in a mature Christian, not just, we're not just nitpicking people, okay? And uh, if it escalates where, you know, the two of you can't, you know, work it out, then it gets more people involved and whatnot. So um, let's look at, um, at the verses before and after. So if you're familiar with, with ancient writing techniques, um, there's this thing that a lot of times they would do, and that's, well, let me kind of break this up in pieces. First off, in Greek, which is what the New Testament was written in, um, you can give emphasis to certain things by how the sentence is arranged. And you can also give emphasis by how the, the paragraph is arranged. Okay, so um, we don't really do that too much in English. Um, our words are kind of determined by how they fit in the sentence. Um, but in Greek, you could kind of move them anywhere. Um, like, it would be okay to say, Todd, the bus drove this morning. Where in, Eng in English, that doesn't make much sense. But in Greek, it would because it, the, the idea is, is, is from the ending of the Greek word, not from its order in the sentence. So it doesn't really work the same in English. Well, when you're reading ancient texts, they also do the same thing, too, where they'll write it in a certain order, not necessarily to tell you the, how it happened, but to kind of draw em emphasize the main point. And that's what we're going to look at in the, verse, in the um, sections before Matthew 18, 15, and after 1820. Um, and I know this sounds kind of complicated. It's, it's really not that complicated. I'll, I'll break it down in just a second, okay? Um, an another thing that sometimes they do is they follow certain themes. So let's look at Matthew 18, 10 through 14, and you're going to start to see the, the, the theme of what's going on here. Because remember, we've been looking at correcting uh, another Christian who's in sin, right? We're very specifically a Christian in sin. We're not just going around starting conflicts everywhere that we go, okay? So then the, verse bo the verses before that, though, say this, starting in verse 10. See to it that you don't despise one of these little ones, because I tell you that in heaven their angels continually view the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If someone has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, won't he leave the 99 on the hillside and go and search for the stray? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices over that sheep, that one sheep, more than over the 99 that did not go astray. In the same way, it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones perish. So let's, let's kind of think about this for a second. What is the main idea of what we just read? Does anybody have any idea? What's the main idea? Okay. And the sheep being, do what? No, 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 what is the sheep? Okay, all right. So so what is the main idea of that story of the sheep being lost? Okay, I think that's pretty good to say like that. Any other ideas? I mean, that's pretty straightforward. <laughs> Don't want to miss anybody. Anybody else have something to say? Well, let's, so let's kind of let's kind of build on what what, our, what uh, Danielle already said. Uh, first off, this passage really shows us God's heart, and it's a mistake to read the verses that we've been studying about correcting a brother who's in sin or a sister brother or sister who's in sin without first reading the verses before it, because the verses before it show God's heart. God doesn't get, God isn't sick and tired of the sheep that want to stray. See that? What we do is, well, they know better. They shouldn't have messed up. So we get tired of putting up with it. But God shows us in the story about the sheep, his heart. He doesn't get sick and tired. He's searching for. And uh, so th this is specifically about Christians who have gone astray. See, when, when, I, when I grew up reading the Bible, I assumed that the sheep was anybody who's lost. But that's actually not what it says. It says that the sheep went astray. 
meaning it was of God's fold, and then it went away. <laughs> it f- fell back. It backslid. It, it got caught up in his sin. However you want to say that. We're talking about a Christian who, who went astray. Now, we as Christians, we're being made like Christ. So what that means is that we should care too. If God cares about this, then we should care too. Now, naturally, in us, we're going to have this kind of irritation. Well, I stayed faithful to God when they didn't, and they can go eat worms. And uh, that, that's kind of how we, we view problems like that. Uh, but that's not how God does. God searches Look at some of the some of the words that that um, that were used in that section. There was searching, rejoicing. These are kind of big deals. I'll go back see here. Um, and it's somewhere towards the middle, it says, "And if he finds it truly, I tell you, he rejoices over that sheep." This is talking about God. God is rejoicing. And before that, at the beginning of the verse, it says, uh, "What do you think if someone?" has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, won't he leave the 99 on the hillside and go and search for the stray? So there's two different words there that are used that are kind of important here. Um, God is searching, he's rejoicing. So if we are supposed to be like Christ, let's compare our heart and our actions with what God just said. See what I mean? Are we searching and are we rejoicing over the one or are we nitpicking? See what I mean? Are we throwing them out? Are we throwing the stones? And uh, I think if we're if we're honest, especially me, um, I think I predominantly get kind of sick and tired of certain people. You know what I mean? Like you're willing to deal with them up to this point, but then you're just kind of like, okay, well I've had enough. It, we're we're moving on. And God doesn't really have that outlook. And so then after he talks about. Um, well, let me hold off on that. Um, so we're not writing them off. We're being patient with them. And so what we do is, 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 I don't know if you guys have ever prayed a prayer this dumb, but I have. God, that you would judge them. Remember the wrong that they have done. Well, <laughs> strike them for the way that they did so and so. Well, <laughs> I don't think that that's really... Uh, congruent with what uh, what Jesus is saying here. So now let's let's follow the let's follow the argument here. Jesus says that when a Christian goes astray, it's like a sheep being lost, and he rejoices over them coming back. And then he says, if your brother's caught into sin, correct them between just you and him alone. Okay, so you're trying to restore here. So we're seeing the heart behind the, the correction. See. When I grew up in church, it was more of a thing of a bunch of rules. You come into the church, you're met at the door. These are all the things you have to do to be a good Christian. And and, uh, people would nitpick about everything. That's the atmosphere I grew up in. (laughs) Well, then verses like this really don't go hand in hand with that. See, what we have to do is kind of learn to accept that we aren't all the same. (laughs) You know what I mean? There's a lot of things that we'll get irritated about. That's just you. You know what I mean? Some people are real strong Republicans. Some people are real strong Democrats. Some people are real strong this or that or the other thing. But our kingdom is actually not of this world, which means we can't be confined to a certain political group. We can't be confined to a certain you know, ideology or whatever. We have to be, in, in a certain sense, above those things and that we are setting our eyes on what God um, desires. And so here we see God is seeking and then the restoration part. So that tells us a lot about correction. Correction should obviously be done with the heart of seeking to restore and rejoicing if they do. So now let's look at the verses after the whole, if your brother is caught in sin, go and talk to him one on one. That takes us to verse 21. This is afterwards. Then after Jesus had said this, Peter approached him and asked, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? As many as seven times? See, this is very important because this is, don't separate the verses. It's one story, one continuous story. We've got the sheep, God's searching after the sheep, correcting your brother who's caught in sin, not nitpicking your brother who's doing something you don't like, trying to work with your brother to restore them. And then we go to this, Peter asks this question, so how many times do I have to forgive them? 
See, if they've gone astray, they've backslid, how many times do I have to welcome them back in the fold before I can just write them off? Seven times? Surely that's a lot of times for someone. I mean, obviously they're not a, not a genuine Christian. They're just a screw-up. So obviously at this point we can write them off, right? And so then Jesus gives them this reply. I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus replied. Oh, yes, it's going to be four times. Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. No, I'm not even good with math. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. So now he's going to tell a story to kind of get the point across. When he began to settle accounts, the the king that is, one who owed 10,000 talents was brought before him. Since he did not have the money to pay it back, his master, you know, this is kind of, might be a little bit confusing if you're not familiar with with ancient history. So let me just kind of, kind of, I'm just going to, change some words right here instead of ten thousand talents let's say one hundred million dollars okay since he did not have the money to pay it back obviously his master commanded that he his wife his children and everything he had be sold to pay the debt at this the servant fell face down before him and said be patient with me and i will pay you everything then the master the servant had compassion released him and forgave him the loan wow that, is a, that was an amount that he would be unable to pay if he worked on it for the rest of his life. This is a really big deal. That servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii. So let's kind of, once again, let's put it in more modern terms, uh, $1,200. Uh, and so then, and that's not an exact measurement. I'm just trying to make it easier to understand. Um, he grabbed him, started choking him, and said, pay what you owe. At this, his fellow servant fell down and began begging him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he wasn't willing. Instead, he went and threw him into prison until he could pay what was owed. When the other servants saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed and went and reported to their master, the the guy at the beginning of the story, everything that had happened. Then after he had summoned him, his master said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt. Excuse me. Because you begged me, shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And because he was angry, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed, which is a little bit of irony because he would never have been able to do that, especially being in prison. Even if he had a job that he was working 24-7, he wouldn't have been able to repay that. So it's kind of like... So also my heavenly Father will do to you unless every one of you forgives his brother or sister from your heart. So let's follow the argument here, okay? Sheep, which is, this is a metaphor for a Christian who has gone astray, okay? Trying to seek them and save them. Okay, so now we get to the story of correcting your brother who's caught in a sin. And now he goes to the story of, well, how how many times do I have to forgive them? And then he tells a story to show what it means. And how we have to forgive from the heart. So now things are getting a little more, a little more escalated, a little more, more intense. So first off, we looked at the order gives the emphasis. The order of the story is very important because it tells us God's heart, not just a series of facts. Then we looked at the way that this is talking about a Christian who goes astray. And now we can kind of get to the next idea here that we should be treating people as we've been treated. So remember, we're talking about a brother who sins against you, not one who offends you. There's going to be, any time you go and meet with any group of people, there's going to be people you don't like, people you don't get along with, and people who rub you the wrong way. And that's not just in church, it's anywhere. I mean, you go to any group whatsoever. And if you're a Republican... Do you like every single person who calls themselves a Republican? Well, probably not. If uh, you go to um, a music class, do you like everybody in that music class? Well, no, probably not. And it's the exact same thing. Um, there's going to be things that people that you don't get along with, and that's not really what we're talking about. We're, talk- we're talking about when, you, when a brother sins against you, how many times do you have to forgive him? I think it's a lot harder to really forgive someone because we get caught up on 
critiquing them. There's like four or five things I don't like about you, right? And so we get caught up on that. And so then we start reading offense into every little thing because I just don't like you. And the story showing is a whole different way to look at it. But what I want you to get from this story is that if you can't forgive somebody their, their offense, their, the, the things that they do that annoy you, if you can't forgive them for that, there's no way you'll, you're going to be able to forgive them for sinning against you. It's absolutely essential that Christians learn how to get along with each other because there will be times when we sin against one another. And when we do, it would be nice if we were restoring one another. Wouldn't, doesn't that kind of make sense? But you won't be able to, re- to forgive somebody if you're, not, if you're getting caught up on every single thing that they're doing that's offending you. So we have to treat people even as we've been treated. So think about how, how good God has been to you, and that's how good you're supposed to be to others. Now that kind of makes a whole nother, whole nother thing, because either we're going to lie to ourselves, and we're going to overlook how good God has been to us and how much we've been given. Or we're going to reciprocate it to others. What I have found is people who are the harshest people and the meanest and rudest people typically are also the harshest and meanest and rudest with themselves, and they don't quite understand God's grace. So they're very uh, harsh and hard against themselves, but then also they don't understand God's grace. Because if we really understand God's grace, that causes, causes us a moment of pause. This is wrong. Like, for instance, this, the story that Jesus just told in that, in that pa- passage. This guy says, hey, you owe me some money, and this is a very large sum. I think he had the right to be offended. And so he says, oh, have mercy on me. He didn't choke him or anything. He just, you know, is wanting his money back. And he says, have mercy on me. He says, ah, you know what, I forgive you the whole loan. Just forget about the whole thing versus how he went out and treated somebody else, this very little was owed. See, we, we forget how much God forgave us, and we remember the little bit that somebody owes us. A practice that I've actually taken up, and I would encourage you to do the same, it revolutionized my prayer life, is when somebody has offended me, and I'm having a hard time pray, uh, praying and getting over it, this is what I do. I say this. God, I pray that you would bless them, and I pray that any punishment that they incur that you would not take into account with what wrong they've done to me that it would be as if they hadn't done anything to me at all you just completely forget whatever has been done wrong on me and when i started praying like that it changed my perspective because i realized that's god's heart for us is restoration god doesn't desire punishment he desires restoration this is even an errant in, in the old testament when for instance in ezekiel it says i don't get any pleasure from punishing the wicked so i think that's really something that we see all throughout scripture it's just sometimes we're so caught up in and being um harsh that we kind of overlook the glory and the grace of the gospel so I uh, I was working at a, working with a church one time, and the pastor there had this board member that was well, actually it was two. There was a leader, like a you know the the, the main instigator, and then he had another one that was kind of like the the crony. I don't know <laughs> what else you'd call that. And so these two board members were just, just like giving a hard time, and they were doing a lot of uh, bad things, yes, but also a lot of morally corrupt things. Um, as far as, you know, kind of using the church as a piggy bank, doing things behind the, the pastor's back. It just, it wasn't good. It was ugly all around. It was just really, uh, really bad stuff that they could have actually been, you know, arrested for. This is kind of a big deal. And uh, so what the what the pastor did is he, he dealt with those things, made sure that they couldn't do it anymore. But he gave them grace, even though they were very spiteful against him. They gossiped about him. They tried to stir up people against him multiple times and caused a church split he still gave them grace and dealt with them patiently now in my thinking i'm thinking that's stupid you d- you have a problem deal with it quickly get them out of there but yet that pastor was the one who was able to show christ's mercy 
Well, it doesn't make sense. You're right, it didn't make sense. The same as it doesn't make sense how God forgives us. It, it, it didn't make sense. This, I don't know. I don't know if it would have ended any better had he dealt with it right now. Because those people were kind of double-faced, and they had a lot of people who thought that they were good people, <laughs> and they could have misled a lot of people. So it probably would have ended badly either way, but he dealt with it in such a way that it showed his character, and that also was able to show the love of Christ. Now, if I'm honest, I don't have that much patience. I'm more of the kind of person that says, you know what, you're, you're too much of a person, you're too much of a trouble, just go, leave. And, uh, well, that probably shows my uh, immaturity. So, you know, that, that pastor, he gave grace. He patiently dealt with the, dealt with the situation. And uh, I found it very frustrating at the time. Now, looking back, I, I kind of get it. And I read this story, and I kind of get that that was the love of Christ shown in action. So that brings me to the next thing I want to point out, is that our response changes us. Our response changes us. Whenever you're going through a situation, how you choose to respond to it will always change you. If you decide to be patient and forgive, it'll change you. If you decide to, it'll change you. I've seen other pastors go in to a new church and they say, oh, there's so many things wrong. So you just made a clean sweep and started from the ground up. Got rid of all the leaders, all the programs, and just... And it changed how that church, those churches viewed themselves. They became places where they weren't, weren't quite so um, friendly with one another. Everybody was kind of afraid that they were walking on eggshells. Since I've come here, I've had actually a couple different people say, well, this is what you need to do, and this is what you need to do, and oh, da, 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 da. it's like, well, the thing about the to-do list, and I want you to understand this because this isn't just for pastors, this is for everybody. The thing about having a to-do list is it can never trump the people. Are there people? Are there things here that I'm going to have to deal with? Yes, I've already started to deal with them. Does that mean I have to deal with them overnight? No. Why? Because every decision that I make is going to impact somebody in this church. See what I mean? So I can get the to-do list done, or I can deal with people. Well, is pastoring more about getting stuff done, or leading people? It's hard walk. It's a hard line to walk, but you always have to make that choice. So. That brings us to another question. How do you know? There's no right or wrong answer. I just want to ask you guys. How do you know that you've forgiven somebody? Truly and, 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 and finally forgiven. No wrong or right answer. Okay, so basically peace in your heart. I don't know if you guys heard that. She said if you're triggered by it, you probably haven't forgiven them. Very good. So anybody else? Go that. Okay. So can, when you say repeat the story, do you mean in the sense of gossip or just in the sense of talking to herself? Okay. Uh-huh. So venting. Okay. So did you guys hear what she was talking about? The way that if uh, it, with Kathy Settle, who was the previous pastor's wife, um, she, when she'd go to say something, she'd say, no, 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 I shouldn't say that because, you know, that would mean I haven't forgiven them. So kind of like consciously controlling her, her mouth, I guess, which is very difficult to do. <laughs> it's very difficult to do that. Anybody else? She said uh, when she can see them and not get upset, she can be, see them and actually be nice. Anybody else? OK. 
Okay, I'm going to go on to four things that I do um, to check if I've forgiven somebody. Excuse me. The first thing, I call these my forgiveness checks. The first things, do I want bad for them? Another way of saying that is, is am I wishing them harm? Or am I doing harm against them? Either or, either wishing it or actually doing it. Am I actively pursuing negativity for this person? Be it in the things that I'm saying, the thoughts that I'm thinking, the actions that I'm doing. Am I somehow and in some way past the sugarcoating? Is there something that I am doing or thinking that is, that is intending harm? Like, well, there are just some people that need to learn how to close their mouths. Well, I don't think I've forgiven them. <laughs> or am I wanting neutral for them or doing neutral for them? So what that means is this. I'm not praying that God would curse them, but I'm also not praying for them. I'm just, I'm, I'm just moving on. Well, I'm not going to do anything to hurt them. I'm not going to go hit them. But if I see them broken down on the side of the road, I'm not going to help them. Or the third category, am I wishing or doing for their good. This means I am actively praying that God would bless them. I am actively looking for opportunities to bless them. And keep in mind that, that sometimes in, in the RL, the real life, <laughs> things get a little more complicated than that, don't they? There will be a situation where, let's say, for instance, um, here, here's actually a situation I have dealt with. Um, you've got this woman and this guy. They have a kid together. CYFD gets involved. Fights get involved. Divorce gets involved. Things just kind of go from bad to worse. And um, there's a restraining order out against them. Would this would be a good example of when, from a distance, from a distance. <laughs> you can't actually do good for them because there's a restraining order, right? Another example is um, when there's complications between a parent and a child, be it from any number of different things, and, and you don't always have the ability to go and correct it, or you shouldn't. For instance, your, your child gets into stuff where they're getting arrested and stuff, and they're wanting you to bail them out. Well, paying for them to get bailed out isn't really being wise because you're kind of trying to put yourself in between them and God's learning opportunity. And you're just going to keep having the same mistake over and over again where you have to keep bailing them out and keep getting involved. Eventually, there's going to be a point, a point where you have to give what Melissa called a couple weeks ago hard love, <laughs> where you just have to kind of let them learn. You're still praying for them. You're, you're not intending them any harm. But there's sometimes that doing good for them, you can't be quite so naive as just blindly doing good. So I, I hope that you kind of see what I'm saying. I don't really want to dwell on that too long. But the main idea here is we're looking at the attitude. Okay. So then the second check that I have is called the Walmart test. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is where you're walking in Walmart and you run into them. Do you go down another aisle? <laughs> Do you feel instantly awkward? It's the Walmart test. Now, Walmart's not quite as popular as it was 10 or so years ago, so it's a little bit different now, but you get the idea. It could be the target test now, I guess. I, I don't know. Uh, the third test that I have is, can I see the good? I found that almost every single time that I haven't forgiven somebody, I can only see the bad in them. I can't see any of the good things that they did. I can't see any of their good character. I can't see anything good. I can only see every single mistake and every single thing that annoys me and all the things that they did wrong and, all, and so on and so forth. But if I can find their good, well, uh, that usually is when I've forgiven them because I typically blind myself to any good aspects until I've forgiven them. And then the fourth test, the fourth check that I have is can I love them? And so for the sake of this argument, I just want to kind of clarify a few things. First off, I'll start with number four. Can you love? Loving is basically sacrificing yourself for somebody else. And we'll talk more about this in about two weeks. But the idea there is, can you sacrifice yourself for them? 
if it came down to two of you getting cancer, would it be you or them? If it came down to, I'm sorry, one of you, not two of you, one of you getting cancer. If it came down to one of you getting shot, who would you want it to be, you or them? Well, I'm doing good. I've got kids. I've got to do, 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 do. Well, that's well. Yeah, but what kind of person do you want to be? Do you want to be someone who dies well or someone who lives for yourself? See what I mean? It's going to mean a lot more to your kids if you sacrifice yourself than if you wished it on somebody else. You see what I mean? Yeah, we give ourselves all these different stupid things in our heads, and we justify it because nobody else can hear it. But if we were to say those things that go on in here out loud, I think that we would realize just how stupid they actually are. That We should not be saying those kinds of things. So, and can you love them? Let's go back to the whole, can you see the good thing in them? There was, there was this person that I, that I was dealing with. There was a situation I had to deal with them. And she was just such a pain. I hated dealing with this woman. I just wish she would go somewhere, somewhere else to the church. Like, there's so many other churches out there. Find one of them. But she was, she was God's little blessing that kept giving and giving and giving. And here she always was. And I was just so tired of it. Uh, and so I was trying to talk bad about them to someone. Yes, I've done stupid things in my life, okay? I was trying to talk bad about them to someone. And the person that I was trying to talk bad about this person with, they kept bringing up good things that they had done. And I was like, would you stop that? That's so irritating. I obviously don't like them. Don't, don't tell me about all these things, about good things that they did. I've made up my mind. Don't confuse me with the facts. And, uh, yeah, it, uh, eventually I stopped talking and I stewed a little bit. It took me a couple of weeks, but I got over it. And uh, so that's what I'm saying. Can you see the good? Can you actually see the good in them? And uh, I hope that those four checks help you. They, they've helped me through a lot of different situations. Uh, next week we're going to look at the, the three do's in resolving conflict. I found out that there's two ways to write that. There's DOS, which looks like DOS which means something for computer users. <laughs> and then there's do apostrophe s, but then you hit a, hit a problem when you do don't because you have to do don't apostrophe t apostrophe s, so it looks really weird. So I just went with, do, with dos, and you're just going to have to know that that says do's, okay? Just, j just take my word for it. It says three do's in resolving conflicts, okay? Um, uh, any questions on anything we talked about tonight? No? Danny, go ahead. Am I understanding correctly that you're talking about somebody who you used to run around with and, and like do bad stuff with? Well, that's not exactly what I had in mind. I, I more had in mind, like, um, if you haven't forgiven somebody and you're just like, oh, that person. Not, I'm not talking about you, you should go and get with all the people who used to you know, go drinking with or something like that. That's that's not what I'm talking about at all. Uh, it's more of an issue of of your attitude and your heart. Okay, so it's, I'm I'm not condemning you for trying to avoid past mistakes. I'm I'm not at all. That's not at all what I was saying. Um, just more of the heart. So when I avoid people in Walmart, it's not because I used to go drinking with them. It's because I don't like them. <laughs> so. Totally talking about something different, but that was a good question. Though. I'm glad you brought it up. Any anybody else? Questions? Okay, so we'll go ahead and close it off there. Okay, uh, remember to pray for Rick and Sandy. They are uh, they're on a trip. If I remember correctly, it's Florida. If I remember correctly, so it's probably some some trip and uh, traveling there. <laughs>